Handmaid Nation. I think we can just like be very casual and kind of geek out about craft and DIY and just have a good time. But to kick it off, I would like to hear you two talk about how you met. Oh my gosh. (laughs) Kate, your role with Handmaid Nation. um, Yeah, just like reminisce and get into the nostalgia here and so we can understand what's the relationship between Faith and Kate here. Faith, how did we meet? I feel like we both have the same look on our faces. I was like, this was not a part of the preparation that I did for this Q&A. Um, I actually, I have no idea, Kate. Let's see. Let's think. Let's like. Was think it Flickr? It. Was it Flickr? It might have been on Flickr. It might have been on Flickr. Um, it was a really it's that's not that random considering no. the timeline I guess that was like an active space for people to connect on it's, it's like I don't it was like social media I guess and I mean but I, I still feel like that time like through Flickr like the friends that I made I would say from 2004 5 and 6 I still have like they're they're like actual real life friends you know almost 20 years later which I think is really great I don't know if I can say that as much for like recent social media stuff, but I feel like that that early early social media was really intense and important for me. But I also think that was where I was like just also developing as a creative person too. Yeah, I mean that's super that that articulates it really well. And it, I wish I could remember clearly, but I it would make sense that that would have been the space that we would have connected. And, and then I guess from there. It, um, you know, I was really, I know I could all speak from my, my interest in, in Kate specifically, like I was interested in Kate's practice and like her dedication, which was already really clear at that point. So it's really interesting to like, look back on it and be like, still, still going strong. But with <laughs> the work that Kate was doing around obsessive consumption, I was really interested in that. And so, um, I had a gallery at the time, like a small Um, little retail space in Milwaukee, Wisconsin that um, sold handmade stuff. And then also there was like a, like a non-traditional gallery space. And so we had Kate come out and do an exhibition. It was February of 2007. (laughs) And because I remember this because I had just started my daily drawing project in February of 2006. And so I, thought it was a tremendously big deal to have exactly one year of daily purchase drawings. And now I have uh, 16 years, 17 years of those. But, um, and it was a two-person show with Stephanie Sahuko, who was in the movie. And it was so cold in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And I stayed in your apartment upstairs of the paper boat. And I was there, there for like a week. It was great. Like there for the install. I, got, I felt like I got to know you really well. It was really fun because it was like, oh, you're an internet friend now. You're a real life friend. And and it was just like, it was, it was also just, I remember being really comfortable staying in your space and getting to know Stephanie, who's just like this tremendous artist. Like, I just feel like the work that she's like has done since then and continues to do, it was just so, so impressive. And just, I am, I'm just constantly impressed by her. Um, but I also remember that's when, that's when I met um, Melissa and JW from Little Friends of Printmaking, who are also in the movie. I met them in person, but I had known them from gigposters.com, like in 2002, 2003, which was this message board about people who made gig posters. And I mean, I didn't make gig posters. I just lurked and like commented. And I was like, I like this. I like that. But like, I, and I feel like since then, like there's, again, there's so many people in that film where just as the time has gone on, like, Faith, I've had you come and talk to my students at PSU. I've had Melissa and JW, like, come and, like, speak at a, a, a big student portfolio show. I've had them, like, it's just, it's, it's been so fun. And Pat Costaldo, actually from Bi Olympia, I met him for the very first time at the Portland premiere in 2009, and I consider him one of my very, very best friends. Like, I text with, he's one of my everyday text friends. Like, yeah, like he, he's, he is definitely, it's, I was just texting with him before. I was like, I can't believe that I met you at the premiere in 2009. And I walked up to him and I was like, cause he, they had just moved by Olympia to Portland. 
and I introduced myself, and I was like, God, you're so funny in that movie. This was, you were so funny in it, and I feel like I basically have been having that same conversation with them ever <laughs> since. Like, I, I'm a very good audience for Pat, but again, it's just, he's, it's, it's just so funny to watch that, and then just with the, the little O2 folks now that live here in Portland, I like, they're, they're, oh. they're my treat for whenever I feel like I've done something good. I go to little Otsu and I buy something. <laughs> so anyway, it was really, it was really fun just kind of like seeing those folks and, and realizing like how much, like how much this was such a touchstone and then how it's kicked off so many just even deeper in, in real life friendships too. So, but that's how I think we met. And then I think during that week at the gallery, you were telling me that Princeton Architectural Press approached you for a book to, as the companion for this. And like, I had, I, at that point, I was, I didn't consider myself an illustrator. I was very much like working in the gallery side of things. I was making, I was making drawings about consumption, drawings about advertising and marketing, but I wasn't kind of participating as a, as a I mean, now I'm, I feel very confident calling myself an illustrator, but at that point I, I was like, work with a book? What do you, a publishing company? How does this work? And, um, and you're like, yeah, you should do that. And then and that's I what we did. I had all the answers. I had no answers for you because I didn't know what it meant either, but I knew I wanted you to do the illustrations. So I was like, let's do this thing. Yeah. Yeah. It yeah. was, it was really fun. And I feel like that was, I, it was a huge, huge learning process for me. And I feel like everyone at Princeton Architectural Press was super patient with me because I'm like, oh, now I have to digitize all these drawings? Like, how does that work? How do I do this? Oh, I really should redraw everything because this pen needs to be thicker. Like, it was me, like, trying to figure out my process as an illustrator, but in real time with deadlines and pressure. And I, I, I feel like that was good, though, because I don't think I would have figured it out had it not been for, like, this big project. Um, so... Yeah, thank you for that opportunity <laughs> because I, I didn't mean, know what the hell I was doing. <laughs> I mean, I feel like that's like a mirror kind of to how I made the film because I didn't, you know, I mean, and I think maybe your illustrations were a little bit more um, successful in the kind of maybe longevity of how they exist still in the world. But, I, you know, figuring stuff out, the the backwards way or like doing it the hard way is definitely like, you know, it's like, you now know what not to do. Oh, 100%. I now know how I would never make a film in many, many ways from that. And then I made a second film and I have a longer list, but yeah. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I, I think that was the long answer to your short question. Yeah. I know. That, that was two talkers, So yeah. That was great. Um, yes. So Kay illustrated the companion book that goes with Handmade Nation. Um, you can read and flip through that book in the exhibition space as well. Um, or check it out at the PNCA library. Um, and then it was so fun, too, because then it was also with all the premieres and screenings. Because I remember it was, it, was, it, was, it was bittersweet when this all ended because I feel like I had such a, like, a, a, a weekly weekly contact with you because you're like oh can you draw something up for the austin premiere and i'm like sure all this blood can you draw something up for the milwaukee premiere sure and so it was just it, and i loved i loved being part of that like i i so um supported and believed in in what faith was doing with this movie that like if i could be a part of it even in a little way by just like sending over scans for uh you know a tote bag for the LA premiere like it it I don't know it just it was it was a it was a confidence boost for sure in me thinking that I could draw for a living basically so thank oh, you I love hearing that I'm <laughs> glad that you got that from that because it was you were very generous with your time so I loved it so yeah I appreciate it. Um, well, I am the mic passer, so who might have some questions for Faith and Kate? Yes. 
And I request that you do talk into the mic so we have the re recorded version. Hi, no thank, thank you so much for showing your, uh, your film today. That was great. Um, I think one of the things that I was really struck by with the film was how much it was a uh, now kind of a historical document of a specific time period that is kind of passed in a lot of ver very definitive ways. Um, and I thought that was it, was, it was the, it put me in 2008, 2009 in a way that very few other pieces of media have. Um, and I guess I was wondering if you could maybe like reflect on that, that kind of like, that that idea and also then like if you know if there was like a you know you could say the hypothetical sequel or like if you just want to talk about like how things have changed maybe in the crafting world or the DIY world in the past you know I guess now you know almost 15 years since the movie came out like how would the how would this sort of portrait look different now Sure. Um, maybe I'll say a few things and then I'm sure Kate can add in some some good reflection as well. Um I appreciate your um, observation and, and the language of saying a historical document. I often refer to Handmaid Nation as a time capsule and a historical document is maybe the language that I would use now if I was like, applying for something. So I always appreciate like perspective and language. Um, but yeah, so like thinking about and reflecting on sort of the the time period of what was going on and, and um, and I think me thinking of it as a time capsule is kind of my way of um, even processing like the amount of work and sort of energy that I had in in that period of my life. I mean, I could never as like my own person, like a, like do what I did then now. So that's kind of interesting for me to think about personally, like what was going on and how I was able to travel around the country with one person and work on this film and meet all these people and run my store in Milwaukee and I was bartending and I just like don't even understand I feel like Kate probably still does the same amount of stuff and also as a parent which I am not but I am not working at that pace anymore in my life but I think um I think the the thing that I value about this project is that it does feel like it really does capture the essence of what was happening within like our community at that time and I think that there are blind spots and there are things that I could have done better and there was missed opportunities but it really I think it does it does have like captures the essence of 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 what what we were all doing and kind of the feeling and the energy and the it felt really important and that was really the intention of me making the film I, I think you know um part of the motivation for what I what I was intending to do in the moment was I saw the momentum of the community that was happening and all of these fairs kind of building up and, and gaining momentum. And there was a lot of larger attention from like, you know, bigger networks on doing shows about DIY and craft. And I just felt really protective of this like group of people who a lot of them I had never met in real life until I made this film. Um, and I wanted to make sure to capture that essence without someone else coming in and sort of, um, you know, kind of capturing it in a way that didn't give accuracy to the energy and the feelings that were going on. So um, I feel really glad about the fact that that happened. And I think that film was the right medium for it. And, and initially I was thinking I was going to make a zine. I was going to like travel around and interview people and do a printed project in it. It is interesting that the book ended up coming out of that, but it would have been a very different project. And I don't think it would have reached as many people as it did if it wasn't a film. Um, so I don't know if I actually said very much there, but I will also say, I guess in reflection, I, I don't I don't think I'm not the person to like reflect on the craft community in its current state. I feel like it's really hard. I mean, I still, I, I work with artists. I, I have worked with artists this entire time. I will continue to always work with artists. It's what I do. Um, and that role for me has kind of expanded into a lot of different directions from, you know, I, I connect people and I work as a curator and I do programming, but um, I think that this film, I don't, I mean, if, if it was a response, you know, a 20 year, like looking back reflection piece that someone was paying me to, work on because I don't think I would do it on my own at this point. Um, I I think the conversation would be even more 
radical and more political and more charged than it was, I think it would be a lot less white. I think it would be a lot, um, a lot more inclusive in a, in a lot of different ways. Um, and that's maybe the one thing that I would do intentionally, but I also think it would reflect on what's going on um, more visibly and more accessibly um, in, in this moment. And maybe that's where I'll leave it. And then if Kate wants to add anything else, I, yeah, I could probably say more, but yeah. That was, that was really good faith. And I support everything you say. And I feel like looking back at that time, um, I try to remember the, um, the energy and the excitement that I felt and I try to pass that along to my students at Portland State because one of my most favorite um, programs, activities that I started at PSU was a student handmade market called Good Market. And I absolutely love like having students and being like, hey, you should turn that illustration into a sticker. And then they're like, what are you talking about? How do you do that? And I actually have incorporated um, like making a product that then you have to sell in a public way into one of my sophomore classes. And I love seeing the, the kind of the initial um, uh, apprehension um, kind of, I always call it, it's, 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 they get nervous, but I say it's a good nervous, like they don't know what they're going to do, and then trying to figure out how to like source materials, and then going through the prototypes, and then having to kind of bring it to this marketplace called Good Market, and seeing people that they don't know purchase it, and it's, it's such a fire that gets lit and it gives them such a boost of confidence in their other work and I just feel like it, it just it starts such a beautiful momentum for for it doesn't even necessarily mean that they have to go into business it's just a beautiful momentum for, for making and for sharing work and for like having them realize that oh my god I did something that felt like it was so scary and it actually was really exciting and fun and now I want to do it again and it's 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 great and I, I always kind of credit that era for for me wanting to continue to do this and I'm actually really excited because this is my shameless plug we're we're back again from the pandemic uh 2022 December 2nd and 3rd at the Lloyd Center um uh, is going to be good market so if you want to buy a bunch of stuff from Portland State graphic design students it's 11 to 7 we're going to be in the old footlocker on the second floor <laughs> <laughs> right by the ice skating rink. So anyway, that's that's my plug. But I love that. I love that. And I, I've always like I feel like one of the one of my like primary teaching philosophies is that I've got to be excited about what I'm doing in the classroom so students get excited about it. And I really love that whole that whole arc of thinking of an idea, <laughs> making something, questioning what it is, if anyone will like even give a shit putting it out in front of people that you don't know and realizing that you can make a connection through something that you make with your hands. Um, I love that cycle, whether, again, whether it's a business or whether they never do it again, I think it's a good thing for, for people to experience. So anyway, that's, that's what I, when I think about that, I'm like, oh yeah, that was, that was how I felt. And I just want to like transfer that to, to other kids too. So um, oh my I, gosh, Kate, I bet you're the best teacher. I just like felt that. I'm like, <laughs> Thanks, Faith. I feel like that energy is so, you don't have, okay, so I was in high school in 09, but, and I wasn't a part of a craft community, but watching this film and feeling that energy of what this whole movement was in that moment, it installing the archive show and I'm watching this in bits while I'm kind of like laying things out I was literally brought to tears because it's just like I think about how how you were saying faith if you made that movie now or did a, a second one that um, it would be a bit more charged <laughs> it would be a different commentary and to look back in time at this historical thing and feel that energy is really inspiring I think it's it's nice to kind of 
hey, there was something that was thriving. And not that it's not thriving, but let's let's be honest, I feel like capitalism has kind of put its claws into things and it's a different beast. You know, we think about Etsy <laughs> and how it was like maybe this burgeoning thing and it was really exciting and now we have all these conflicts with it. So in order, <laughs> let me try to bring it back here. It's just inspiring for me to watch that as a maker myself and think, hey, yes, we got to keep that punk mentality, that DIY mentality, community matters so much. The things that I make and put my heart and soul in and so many others matter so, so much. And I think that th maybe we're seeing another moment of resurgence with DIY and craft. I, I mean, yeah. let's take, for example, we're doing a graduate symposium on DIY and craft all of a, a sudden. So the pandemic maybe put some things into motion. So I, I really, nice. I want to second that because I feel like this has been the first term that we've been fully back in person with students. And so like my, my first year students were juniors and seniors in high school and they did Zoom online, basic. I mean, they did, they did school online. Um, and everyone is um, really wanting to make things with their hands. Like, I feel like before the pandemic, I, I feel like, I don't know, and you can concur. I mean, Alana's in UIUX at, at PSU, but it's like, I feel like there wasn't as much momentum for like printing things and for like making things with your hand. There was a lot of like digital mock-up stuff. And, and now I feel like my classes, like they don't know how to print. Like that's definitely, it's like, whoa, no one knows how to print anymore. But they really want to print and they want to make things. Like I had a kid come up to me and he was like, okay, I want to make a 144-page leather-bound book. How do I do this? <laughs> I'm like, okay, okay, let's take a few steps back. Yeah. Like, I love your enthusiasm, but let's scale into this maybe. Have you heard of a zine? But, like, it, it was just, it's, it's cool. It's cool. And I also, just through, like, the um, workshops that I do at Outlet, like, they were great before the pandemic, but then I, I feel like everything went on Zoom. We all lived in Zoom land. We still did workshops on Zoom, but when we started doing workshops in person again about a year ago, and again, it could still just be like the high of doing things in person again. Like everyone in those workshops, it's really felt like a, a super special, um, again, highly charged experience. And after every workshop, I turned to my business partner, Leland, and I'm like, that was really good. How is everyone, just, like, that, how is this really good? Again, like, everyone, and it's just, I don't know, I, I, I love that. And I feel like just from running this print shop, too, like, more people are wanting to do print. More people are wanting to learn how to do things. Like, I feel like attendance in, like, workshops are high, high, high. Um, I, I think it's an interesting place. Um, so... I, I don't know where that's going to go, but I definitely feel very excited about it. I went to Seattle last weekend. They had a short run zine and art book fest, and it was insane. There was 800 people in like the first 30 minutes. There was 5,000 people that went through the like the small auditorium in one day. We were everyone was nonstop like talking and selling. The, the energy was just, it was wonderful. It was a dreamy weekend. I haven't been to a zine fest that was that crazy in a long time. So who knows? But it's, I'm here for it, basically. I'm here for it. Likewise. <laughs> Likewise. What other questions? Yes. Um, okay, so first I want to say that, um, yes, Kate is a super fun instructor. Like, everyone wants to take her classes. I, I miss Thanks, them. Denise. I miss them so much. Um, so I know that, I noticed that in the um, film, there were a few who said they had um, gone to art school, and now this they were, you know, making a living from their crafting and doing craft fairs and their online business, you know, wh however they were doing that. And I, I know sometimes it feels like, at least in the grad programs, such a heavy focus, and I'm in print media, so there's such a heavy focus on becoming a gallery artist and showing in, you know, a variety of formal gallery spaces, but then I see this film and I think, but it seems perfectly valid that maybe that's not your goal and maybe your goal is to um, 
make what you make and, and just sell personally, you know, to, to the public. Um, so I guess it does make me um, question, do you think there's a separation between fine art and craft, or is it really just a matter of the space it's presented in? Do you want to take that, Faith? Sure. I mean, I have a, kind of a canned answer that maybe I, I will say what I would respond to that normally, but I do, I want to answer that, but I also just want to say, um, I, I couldn't hear super well, but I heard, I think I heard you say something about, um, just like the, per, like feeling the permission to maybe not feel the pressure of showing in, in a gallery space and just making the work for yourself and selling it, but then also I always like to add in like the option of also making the work for yourself and choosing to not sell it at all and to like fully remove the like um, impulse to have to turn your passion into a business. And because, and that's for me learning over the years that I thought I wanted to have my own business of things that I made and then kind of ruining my passion for the things that I made because I turned it into a business and then it became my job. And so I, I like to always speak about that when I talk about making stuff and selling it, because I think it's nice to just like put that back out into the conversation. So I just want to like put, dangle that out there. Um, but I do think framing the conversation around like what how work is um, perceived based on the space it's being presented in is a really um, interesting way of framing that question. And I actually have never had anyone ask it in that way, but I personally feel like so I guess I don't I don't know if I heard if you're asking specifically about is work defined based on the space that it's being shown in or the way that I would normally answer the question if I interpreted your question in a certain way is I personally believe it's up to the person who's making the work to define the work or to define themselves how they want to. So if someone defines themselves as a, you know, as a maker, which is, I feel like language that sort of came out of this movement, I'll, I'll call it a movement, um, which is sort of this, like, it's just as an elusive word as craft is, but it is, it's a little more encompassing and maybe a little less backing someone's backing yourself into the craft corner if they're, because people do have a hangover from, from craft in different ways. Um, but I, I feel like, so the name of the show, the craft fair that I did for 10 years in Milwaukee when I lived there um, was art versus craft because I was constantly being asked as soon as I started working on this project was, you know, you know, the conversation about art and craft. And I really came into um, talking about craft from the left field and wasn't prepared to be the person that people were asking questions about craft too. And I got put in a lot of positions where I was speaking to, you know, room, room full of academics and curators who had been talking about fine craft and art. And, and I just um, am not worried about it, <laughs> which is really frustrating to a lot of people. But I, I do think that a space, I do think though, to answer and, and to maybe just comment on your, what you pose, like, I do think that context for anything is is really a, an interesting way to, you know, it's like how you package something really. It's like, how is something, I mean, not to call it marketing, but you could put something in a white wall gallery that has a reputation and call it fine art and sell it for a lot of money because of who they are. And that same thing could be valueless, you know, in a different space. So I don't know if that's an answer, but I do think that things in different spaces are viewed in different ways. And, and that's, um, but I don't think that people, you know, I think that it's, it, I, I just really feel like it depends on the person who's making the work and what they want to do. Like, does someone want to be a, have a gallery, you know, career and, and go that route, which is like super challenging and has a lot of hurdles. And I think most students don't have any concept about what that even means or what, um, how rare it is to have a successful, you know, be, be the conversation around being a working artist is like a really complex, complicated conversation. So oftentimes when I'm speaking with students and I, you know, I don't teach, but I work with a lot of students. Um, 
is I think there's a lot of layers to peel back about like generational wealth and like where are people, you know, what are, how do people, what does being a successful artist mean? And people have jobs they don't talk about. And there's all sorts of layers that we don't even discuss, which has nothing to do with your question, except that I feel like it is a part of the conversation. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll stop there and Kate, if you want to jump in. I, I feel like I've, again, agree with what Faith said and also I feel very fortunate to have always kind of come from a position of more um, utilitarian maker like that hasn't been a baggage that I've necessarily had to deal with too much like and also I feel very fortunate that I come from a family of artists like my grandma and grandpa were commercial illustrators so I grew up like watching them make a living with the things that they were making from their hands. And then my mom and dad were weavers. I grew up going to um, craft shows in the 70s and 80s and early 90s, which it was interesting like just seeing like different waves of things because my mom and dad, like their year of their weaving business was 1977 and that was the year that I was born. And so their last year of their full-time weaving business was 1995. That was the year I graduated from high school. So it was just basically that was my entire arc of, of being in a family where there was looms in the living room and I would be like playing with skeins of yarn. I remember I would, I would <laughs> this, is, this is maybe where also money gets into the equation because I was, very I was very motivated by money at a young age because I would like wind skeins of yarn and I would get five cents for every skein that I would yarn. And I'm like, I am going to make this giant pile of nickels. Here we go. Um, but it was, it was kind of just like infused in me. But I also like remember like people not understanding what my mom and dad did, but that they sustained a living from making things with their hands. And I want my students to sustain a life of creativity no matter how that looks, because it's gonna look different for everyone. And again, I feel very fortunate to be having these conversations with graphic design students and illustration students, and the conversation is more complicated when I'm talking with like MFA students. Um, the conversation is more complicated when I'm talking with fine arts students because I'm like, you should make a print of that. <laughs> you, have you thought about licensing this work for um, patterns? Like, and it's just, it's, it's, a, it's a harder conversation to have and I'm happy because they're like, oh, this is my art. I'm like, yeah, but you, could, you can also like make more money so you can make that art and continue to make that art. Um, so again, I feel um, like I'm, I'm a big, fan of just empowering students to figure out how they can sustain that life of creativity through making and um, it looks different for everyone and there's so many different ways that you can do it and it doesn't have to be a gallery. I mean Denise, like I was a printmaking um, MFA student and I would show up for critiques with like my GoCo printer and that was so uncool. <laughs> <laughs> don't don't love it too much. They don't make the supplies anymore. Um, but but it was just I remember that thing where I'm like, oh, I'm additioning everything wrong. I'm I'm such a dirty bad printmaker. But I'm like, but I love to make multiples, and I love to like I love just being able to, like printmaking is such a democratic process and a wonderful way to make. Like, yeah, I'm a quick and dirty printmaker. I don't care. I I love it. But being in grad school, I was like, oh God, I should be like doing some very like fancy etching right now but that's not me and so it's just yeah it's not me but kate, do we rem do you remember kate when we when we took you to the art fair i mean it was a small weird art fair but you set up the booth and kate did this like beautiful this is like an interesting example i mean this is like part of the conversation i feel like we kate in a, in the booth for my gallery Kate did this like kind of cozy like living room feel like pit like big obsessive consumption pillows that she was making that were like bright and bold and then had all the drawings pinned up on the walls and I remember this and then you did this in the gallery too where all the pins you painted the heads of the pins for each month or each week I don't remember you had some wild ass system where you had hand painted all the heads of the pins for the install art fair 
but there it is th you know thinking about having the context of the work and where it's being shown and how it's being presented and who it's who's presenting it but you know that's a conversation also about gatekeepers and access and privilege and so there's so many layers right to the conversation but i do think um Kate, again, just like the, I think the things that the seeds that you're playing with your students are so important and it's, it's really exciting. I feel like it's probably doing a lot of good for people. Thank you. Yeah. Just going to keep giving you compliments after yes. each. <laughs> I like you a lot too, Kate. I also can't speak to anyone else, so I feel like I'm talking to you. So. <laughs> I love it. Okay. We got another question on one side of the room and then we'll go to the other. Um, what do you think of like the easy accessible um, methods of automated processes like um, 3D printing and laser printing in relation to handmade objects? I, I, I love it. Like I, I'm again, I'm all about whatever kind of enables a person to make. It's going to look different. Mm -hmm. um, I, I love like I think about I think about we've got a um, a lab over at PSU called SETI Lab, which Alana was really involved with. And there's a lot of like cool stuff there where I'm like, yeah, you should go use the plasma cutter to, to make a bunch of stuff, or you should check out the laser cutter, or you, I, the 3D printer, go for it. Like, I think, I think having, a, a, again, a, a, a fear of tools um, just kind of limits, limits what, what can be done, and I don't, I don't want to stop anyone from, from making things, no matter how, how that looks, essentially. I'm not sure if that answers your question, but I'm, I'm down with it. Yeah, sure. Um, because um, sometimes I feel like it relates much to like the mass production of objects. Like It could be easily reproduced nowadays using the technology. And like going back to like crafting, it's like um, an opposite of like mass 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 pr production, like everything handmade, right? But I also think that if you are wanting to make 75 keychains out of really cool fluorescent like, like um, plexiglass and you want to carve that, I would much rather you save your hand <laughs> and just use the tools that you have access to and use that design that you've created so you can get that work out there. And I use that as an exact example because I have a student that just made 75 fluorescent keychains from plexiglass um, in the lab. And it was awesome. And But she sat there and she's like packaging them all up and she's putting key rings through. I mean, it's, it's still it still feels like it's made by a person but that tool made it easier for her to make a lot of them and quicker so she could work on something else, which, like, more power to you. So, but, I mean, on a large scale, I, I, I mean, again, I, I'm, I'm fascinated by all the different print technologies that are out there, and um, I just love printing. I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> it can be 3D. It can be whatever. Yeah. Go yeah. for it. Thank you. Maybe I'll just add one thing. I think like there's also, there's like, I, and I, I also, I'm having a hard time hearing the audience questions, but I think I caught enough to just mention, I, I just feel like there's also a tipping point of talking about mass produced, like, you know, at a, even if someone's making like 200 of something, that's still really small. Really low. Small as opposed to, you know, the amounts of quantities of things that are actually getting mass produced on like a larger scale. But then the conversation also is kind of about technology and tools and like craft, you know, craft. And th this is a larger, again, a larger conversation, but, um, and I think printmaking is an easy, it's an easy one to kind of target, but you can talk about textiles and what kind of looms people are using um, and programming and what technology is going into weaving. Um, and, and embroidering and chain stitch embroidery on machine, you know, it's like what technologies are we using to create our handmade goods? And so I think there is something about maybe the intention behind the work and um, and maybe the the. Yeah, I guess it's an intention. So and and, and it's something about um, the, the, the connection of the people and it's not just about the stuff. Um, and so 
And, and I think like the the tipping point of things being mass produced, there is there. I think there is a tipping point, and that that was a conversation that started to come up, I think, within the community as some of the people and some of the the makers started to get like larger like licensing deals with bigger companies and what you know it's like it's like the conversation that happened within you know the music like within the the DIY music community of like selling out and it's like what who oh someone got it you know gets a job like designing for a bigger company based on their like small business and like it's 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 complicated and it's complex like everything and I think it's there's there's no one answer to that and it's an interesting part of the conversation and i think you know etsy was mentioned as a marketplace and as a part of this time period just really briefly and i, I don't know if it was hannah who had said it but i had to look up i had to look up the dates of a lot of things before this just to kind of make sure i was on the right timeline because i get really like time is very elusive at this point and um and i was so etsy was founded in 2005 and that was right around the time when I was um, doing the pre-product, like thinking about starting the documentary and I was like lightly talking about it and we were in communication and Etsy was very, I just want to say this because I think it's an interesting kind of side note for those of you who are still sticking around. Um, I intentionally didn't include Etsy as a part of the documentary. It was like an intentional decision. There's, there's some things that say Etsy, they were around at all the shows. And it wasn't because I was against Etsy. I was very, I was, you know, I used Etsy. Etsy was supportive. They gave monetary support and they were really, um, it was really important part of like a lot of us being able to sell our work easily online. I, there was not like, a, there was no marketplaces. We had to build our websites and Etsy gave people a space to be able to just like take a picture and upload it and sell. It was really a pivotal, pivotal moment for selling your work online. Um, but um, I had, I just knew I had this feeling that I just didn't want to like make an Etsy commercial. I was worried that if I put Etsy in the documentary because they were so persistent and around and it was like really like, I just was like, I'm not, I'm not going to intentionally include this. So it was a very specific decision, but, um, I was at their launch party in Brooklyn in 2005. And I just remember like people just didn't care. They didn't know what it was. It took a while for Etsy to like gain momentum and become a really important tool that people use. And then there was the tipping point where they started letting people sell manufactured goods. And it was really an upheaval moment and people had a lot of feelings about it. Um, yeah, so that felt like I wanted to br bring that up anyways, and this felt like a place to kind of put that back in. So that, It was such a smart move because I feel like at that time, Etsy felt like it, it would have been like, oh, yeah, sure, be in the movie. I mean, I think that's such a smart move that you didn't do that. Um, but, I mean, like like you, um, I, it, Etsy, when they first started, they were, it was a small company. It was a, it was, it, they were super supportive. It was my first online store. Actually, I take that back. I had a, a weirdo online store in like 2002, but my, like my first one <laughs> that was like, had like a real payment system behind it and things like that. Um, and then I went, I was invited to their headquarters in Brooklyn for their fifth year anniversary. And they had me paint a big mural on their wall of, it was so fun because it was, I asked people on the internet what their favorite Etsy purchase was, and then I did live drawings of all <laughs> of their Etsy purchases, and it was just this, it was one of my first, again, first time for everything. It was the first mural that I've ever done, and it was just such a fun thing, and at that time, Etsy had like 70 employees, and the, the main kind of um, creative director of Etsy was someone that I had met on Flickr, in like 2004, Randy Hunt, who was just a super sweetheart, and um, and it was yeah, it was it was just it was it was really it was they were doing some cool stuff, doing some. But mm -hmm. then there was that tipping point, and then yeah, that yeah. <laughs> there's no Blomp. there's no there's no good wrap up for that one basically. No, we'll leave it at that. Yeah, I think was there one other question? I don't. I know people. I don't want to be yes. mindful of people's yes. times. So. Here's another one. Hi, um, I'm of the same generation of maker and was within the area during the um, highlights of the people who were making in the film. 
And I'm an educator here at PNCA, and I run the MFA in Applied Craft and Design program, which features like a creative entre entre ugh, entrepreneurship track in it, um, two class part, two part class. And I'm curious, now that I'm older and quote unquote maybe wiser, I pull that same kind of energy that I had back when I was making in, in that time period and attempting to create an LLC of a business that then it went under because I didn't understand exactly how to do it. I'm wondering that energy of the both of you that you had back during that time period, looking back on it with the older and wiser lens, what is the advice that you would give your younger self? Because I think when I think about it, my advice is kind of the passion that I bring to the entrepreneurial side of the program is that I was never educated on how to do that and I didn't have access to knowing how to do that. And there's got to be something that's going to change. And so that's where like if I look back on that time period and look with those wiser, older and wiser, that older and wiser lens, I think about that, like what I wish I would have known, but I'm curious, what is that, what you would have told yourself at that time period, now that you know more? Or maybe you wouldn't, maybe it was just so blissful that it's okay not to, um, but I'm just curious. I mean, that's a great question. Yeah. Thank you for asking that. Um, Kate, do you have something that's like rising to it's, the surface? I'm, I'm, I'm reflecting because I feel like, oh my gosh, I was in, that, when I categorize that time, I think it's very, I lived, it was end of grad school for me, so like 2001, 2002, 2003, and then I moved to Mississippi to take my first assistant professor job and so that was 2004 to 2008. And that was the time frame. And then when I moved to Portland was 2008. And so it was an interesting kind of like, like straddling of like me living in Mississippi and then coming to Portland where I'm like, ooh, Portland. Like yeah. this is just, this is just like the internet. You know, it's just, it was like a total, it was ridiculous <laughs> in that way. Um, and I think, and again, I didn't know what I was doing. Um, and again, like you said, like you, no one really told you what to do. And I kind of, I'm like, I go back and forth. I'm like, I don't know if I would have wanted anyone to have told me how to do these things. Um, I, I really liked reflecting back. I liked kind of fucking up and like learning from that and trying it again. And I, I liked maybe not being handed the, the the tools to do the things in the way that was like right and appropriate um, because I feel like I have always kind of carried this this like oh we don't have money we can still do it <laughs> kind of attitude like into teaching at a public university where it's I was told just recently it was like we don't have to be so scrappy all the time you always come from a point of view where you're like we can do this for free. You don't have to do it. I'm like, but I kind of like that challenge. And but I'm like, oh, what am I doing? Um, I, I do think I still have a lot of that um, I, spirit of, of like, I don't know how to do this, but I'm going to do it anyway sort of mentality. And I appreciate maybe not being the smartest person in the room to be like, I'm just going to go forth and do it anyway, because I've never been one to really overthink something. Um, for better, for worse, I'm just like, let's put it out there and see what happens. And I, I hope to continue to not overthink the things that I do. So I, I, I do think, though, looking back at me in my late 20s, early 30s, um, probably to, like, stretch <laughs> and to get a better chair and to set a timer to get up and walk around. Um, more, mostly health things, I would say, because like Faith was saying, I feel like we would do some pretty epic, like focus in on work mode and just 
work, 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 but it's it, the line gets blurred when it's like n now the thing that you love then turns into a job and then you just keep doing that thing. Um, yeah, mostly, mostly stretch and get a good chair. So <laughs> that's what I would tell myself. <laughs> I'm laughing because I already talked about chairs today once. Uh, <laughs> I go off on my students. I'm like, you might think it's really expensive to get a good chair, but you can write it off. You can do that. Like, I'm just like, get a hey, good I'm chair. Sitting on a, I'm sitting on a wooden stool right now. And I'm like, I know it's awful. So yeah, get a good chair. I second that. I'm also telling I'm, I wrote it down in front of me. Um, yeah, I think like health stuff is like really challenging to tell people like, I mean, I, if someone would have told me when I was younger, like you should take better care of yourself. It's like, it just doesn't, you don't hear it. I feel like no one's going to hear it, but I feel like it's a part of the larger discourse right now of people talking about taking care of themselves. I think it's hard to reflect yeah. like objectively because of the internet and so much information and act, like having access to like information and resources in such a different way now versus then but something I think that I would tell myself and I talk to students about this but like again it's like I feel like I just I'm like oh yeah I'm a, I look I'm old to you so you're not going to be like okay whatever old lady but I you know I really felt like I had to do it all yeah. and I, I had like some serious like burnout happen, not just from Hamay Nation, but from like all of the things. But all of those things were really important to me. So if it's really complicated and, but I think that there's an element of pacing oneself that is really valuable, how to communicate that to someone um, who's not interested in hearing it. It, it does, it's like, that's probably like parenting 101. I don't have children, but you, I don't think you can do that. But I think you can talk about it and and be really transparent. So something that I do talk about um, with students and when I'm talking about the, the pros and cons of like my own like trajectory and my own career, my own success and failures is that like there there was fallout from certain things that happened. And and I do talk about the fact that I was bartending the whole time because I have had this incredibly successful career. But I also like I went into a lot of debt. I funded my films on credit cards and I paid them off. You know, like I think people don't talk about like the realities of what it means to like exist. And that's like a shortcoming to me of the educational system. And also just people wanting, not wanting to like, you know, look professional. And so conversations around what it means to be successful and professional are shifting, but that's the thing that I would reflect on. And that I would, I think are the conversations that I'm interested in having and that I would maybe tell my younger self. Um, I think there's probably other things, but those are things that I think about now and I try to talk about a lot. I, so. I, yeah. I, and I try to, I try to do that with my students too, where the things that I really wish I had a better handle over even now, a lot of that is financial and money management. Like even like just today in my senior portfolio class, um, I have my badass accountant, Jenna Golden, come in. She comes in four times a year, and she gives a two-hour workshop on taxes for freelancers, and it's so good, and it's so empowering, and she's like, no one, no one at school has asked me to do this. You're the only one that asked me to do this, and I'm like, that is ridiculous. That is ridiculous, and it's, it's still, it's like, it's a, it's a thing that I was railing against, you know, years and years and years ago when I was doing my credit card project where it's just like we don't we don't have any sort of financial literacy financial education that's happening and it I was upset about that in 2004 and now it's 2022 and I'm still I'm still upset about that um so I I I think it is it's it's really helpful in 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 empowering to know how to handle money. And that's definitely something that me as a 45 year old, like I, I'm like, I'm taking classes to figure out budgeting stuff right now, because I want to figure out like, how, how do I like make money work? How do I make it work for me? And it's just, it's ridiculous, but it's also not. And I try to have these conversations with my students because 
it's money is a weird thing to talk about still, even though I think the conversation is, is getting more open and transparent. Um, it's still sweaty. It's still sweaty. So. And a lot of people don't, are, you know, there's no one. I just had a conversation yesterday about like freelance work and like, what do you, someone asked me, like, would you be willing to talk to me about like rates and like what you charge? And there's just all everyone, no one wants to talk about. It's just like so complicated and it's all woven up into the art world that's woven up into academia and um it's it's so that i think like talking about money is vital and yeah. it's and it's becoming more normal and it's hard for people to talk about their their class background and like where they're coming from and to integrate that into conversations um you mentioned something kate that about like um i think you and i share the the similarity of like be, like working in a way where we're like, I'm going to just gonna do this thing and maybe I'm not doing it right, but I'm just going to do it and put it out there. And like, that's something that I, I still also continue to do and Always. I don't see change. <laughs> and I'm, um, but something that I, you know, I have, maybe it's a little bit of a privilege and it's a little bit of just where I'm at in my life, but like, I try really hard to not work for free anymore. And I really, that's something that I would maybe tell my younger stuff. And this goes back to finances. It's like, there's a lot of labor that like, I should have, even if it was just a gesture of getting paid, like I shouldn't have been doing for free. And so that's something that I, I think, and, and, and labor that I asked of people that I shouldn't have been asking. I mean, I, Kate, I probably like owe you a lot of money if I had no idea, like that, those kinds of transactions of what, how things were going on. And I, yeah, so that, that's something that I think with students, um, I try and, you know, talk to them about their internships and like, are you getting paid at your internships, these kinds of things. Um, but yeah, the amount of time that goes into all of the stuff to make it happen is just like, it's the burning the candle from both ends only lasts for so long. Yeah. And I will say you, when this you is owe like, me nothing. You owe me nothing. <laughs> <laughs> dinner next time I get on an airplane to Portland. <laughs> I, I want to say just as like a fun fact, um, just like as far as like the, the wild things we do for time and how much time we put into stuff. Um, the opening credits, I when mm -hmm. I, I watched the film today and I hadn't watched it in a very, very long time. And just watching the, the opening credits were if you guys were there on time and you saw them, the stop animation. So that's like a two minute, two minute, 30 second sequence. That was kind of like my creative um, contribution to the film. It was done at the, we did it at the end after we were done shooting and the editing process for the film was really long and complex, like complicated. But um, that was a intense, this is something I would never do now. This was, that was the 26 hours for that two minute and 30 second um, piece. And it was done over a two day weekend in a borrowed studio in Chicago. Um, with the help of five other people who also spent, like, I mean, no one should work 26 hours in a two-day period. Um, and those were the kinds of things that it was just like, well, we got to do it because we got to get it done. And this is like the important thing that has to happen. Um, so I would tell my past self to never do that again. <laughs> and never that again. Like, you know, that's an example of something. So, and everyone um, should go check out the archive and look at the actual stitched thing in the ephemera and appreciate Faith's labor. Um, let's do one more question. And then I think, you know, we've been going at it for a while. It's super late for Faith over on the East Coast. So maybe one more. Okay. Uh, I'll, I promise a statement. Um, <laughs> that's all I promise. So just thinking about um, this movement um, and my kid and being a teacher, uh, the thing that I always go back to is um, to create more and consume less. And, and so that's like a, a big thing for me is that that's what makes the difference between you know, it doesn't matter what tools you use. Like my kid loves video games, create a video game, like, you know, just to, and I feel like that is kind of what we need right now, especially after COVID is I just, I, I'm hearing students now saying, I don't know how, and oh, yeah. then they stop yeah. because they haven't been in that cross pollination, like arena for a while. Yeah. 
Um, that's my statement. You could try to make a question out of it. But I mean, Alana, I think that's that's a, that's a really good mantra, though, too, is to is to create more and consume less. And I think that translates to something that is like, I'm always telling myself too, where it's like, be an active participant. Just be an active participant in your life, because I feel like it's so easy, especially to just like passively consume and passively scroll on your phone. Like it's like. I try to actively either make something every day or actively engage with something. Like, it's just, it's such a, it's like, uh, and I just, you've got to just try to remind yourself to be an active participant because it's so easy to just like check out, especially when you're just like, what the hell is going on in the world? I'm just going to look at my phone and fall asleep. The end. Um, so, yeah, I like, I like your, your summary of, of uh, create more, consume less. And I, you know, I think that's what this film was trying to do, um, was just like show that, you know. I think that's a great place to end on a nice note. But yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Really good. Thank really you, good. everyone, for coming out. I know some of you. I don't know a lot of you, but it's just been me personally a really nice blessing to feel the good vibes of what community and making and how to find joy in this world. So I appreciate you all for coming out and Kate and Faith, thank you so much for ch chatting with us and giving so much of your time. Um, I'm, I'm personally very inspired. Um, and I, now I'm realizing I didn't introduce who the heck I am. I am Hannah <laughs> Bakken Morris and I'm the dr interim director of the galleries here. So thank you for attending. Thank you, everyone, so much. Thanks for coming out and, and listening to Faith and I reminisce about a project that was very important to both of us, what seems like yesterday, but it was a while ago. It was a while ago. Yeah, 20 year anniversary in 2026. <laughs> wow. So I realized, Kate, I put it on my calendar for the end of next year to start thinking about what reflection might look like. So I might be calling you to make a okay, anniversary. Good project so we'll everyone the, everyone can be witness to that i'm here i'm i'm, I'm ready to draw for you again <laughs> let me know <laughs> it'll be forever you timeless guys, I appreciate it hannah thank you so much and thanks yes. everyone for coming thank okay i'll thank talk you. to you yeah i'll yeah. talk to you soon bye-bye <laughs> do i hang up